Draft Mechanic is a proud member of Punchboard Media. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Draft Mechanic, episode 96. On this episode of Draft Mechanic, it's Expandapalooza 2, the legend of board games gold, I guess? We'll be talking about expansions for Euphoria, Imhotep, 5-Minute Dungeon, Altiplano, and not one but two Terraforming Mars expansions. No, that's expansion. And finally, we'll be talking about variants, the expansions of beer. So sit back, relax, grab a pint, and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Draft Mechanic. I'm Jake. And I'm Danielle. And Draft Mechanic is the podcast about board games and craft beer and anything we can do to tie the two together. Here at Draft Mechanic, we like our beer like we like our board games. With a little something extra for variety. Certainly. I think that's fully applicable today as it is Expandapalooza 2. 2. 2. The expansion of Expandapalooza. (laughs) Pretty much. We've got, what, five? No, six different expansions to look at for five different games today. And we decided, let's just make a whole day of it. Expandapalooza 2. We did this once last year. So that means we have a thing we can do again and again now, right? It's precedent, yes. (laughs) It's precedent. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this here episode of Draft Mechanic. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for tuning in. Regular listeners, thank you for coming back yet again. You can get in touch with us on the internet, draftmechanic.net or at draftmechanic on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all the usual social media places. We also have a board game geek guild that is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up there for this episode as there is for every episode. So if we're saying something and you have an opinion that you would like to share with the group, that is the place to do it. Mm, yes. And also, if you would like a micro badge, we do have a draft mechanic micro badge. And I want to throw a shout out to our four new micro badgers, Brendan O'Neill, the big M, Drew Modlinski and Kevin Dale. We are up to 82 now, 82 micro badgers, and we've got five episodes left. Uh, Wait, no, four. Four episodes left to get up to that 100 before episode 100. I know we can do it. Thank you out there for picking it up. If you do need the Geek Gold, we have plenty of Geek Gold. Come and visit us in the guild and say, hey, I need the Geek Gold, and we'll be like, yo, here it is. Just slide it to you under the internet table or on top. It's not really like, it's not like an under the table deal. I'm just going to slide you some Geek Gold. You're just going to do the right thing. weirdo. Yes. If you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, we do twice monthly meetups, one on the first Thursday of every month and one on the third Tuesday. Our next meetup, if you are listening to this right when it comes out, is going to be on Thursday, March 7th at Good Road Cider Works. Mm -hmm. We would love for you to come out. They have really tasty cider. They've also got some meads. They've got some craft beer. They've got some non-alcoholic beverages. It's a great space. We would love for you to come and play some games with us. And you can check out all those events on Facebook. I do remember to post those there about a week in advance so that you can... (laughs) What? What? Sure you do. (laughs) Okay, sometimes five days and sometimes ten days in advance. But you can follow Draft Mechanic on Facebook and get notifications on those if you are in the Charlotte area. Danielle, it is Expandapalooza, and oh boy, are there a lot of expansions being announced, coincidentally, right now just as well. Tell me about them. Well, first off, we have an expansion that you're not super excited about for Mm. Anachrony. This is called Fractures of Time, and it's coming to Kickstarter in April. It apparently is adding a fifth player, or at least it looks like it's adding a fifth player, plus a new dangerous mechanic called Blinking that allows you to move, uh, allows you to teleport already placed workers by fracturing reality. Okay. It has a new mechanic called Blinking. Yes. We have the Blinking mechanic. It's where you shut your eyes and then you reopen them. Look, just because you want to shut your eyes on Anachrony does not mean that I am not excited about this. I like Anachrony a lot, and I'm excited that they're getting back into it and putting something new in here. It is probably just going to be a, like, you know, free worker reassignment mechanic or something, like how the time travel is just kind of a fancy loans, but... I feel like they did an awesome job theming Anachrony, and I'm super excited that they're bringing this high-concept sci-fi stuff to a worker placement game and giving me some new stuff to play with. I am excited that you're excited, (laughs) but if I remember correctly, my review of Anachrony was I can Mm. play half of this game and still do just perfectly fine as if I were playing the whole game, so Mm. I don't need another third to bolt onto the half I already wasn't playing. Well, fine, fine. I did a very good job using time travel to its fullest, and I did win very frequently. I really like Anachrony, even though it's a massive box that I could probably accidentally knock myself out with if I dropped it off of a shelf, and it is probably the most Kickstarter excess unnecessary component stuff with those, uh, the exosuit miniatures you really don't need just to be a worker that you put a cardboard chit in, but oh man, it looks cool, and I love, I just really love the game, and I want to play a little bit more of it, so maybe I can finally get this one back out again? Maybe? 
Hmm. Come on. You want to play Anachrony again in a year? Hmm. Come on. <laughs> I'm sure that I'll be mentioning that on Kickstarter as we know more about it in April, but at the very least, it is there. Hmm. Along with expansions, we have the official announcement of Terraforming Mars expansion number five. <laughs> <laughs> guaranteeing Are we only up to five? Yeah, well, Turmoil is the next one and it will be coming at Essen and that will be number 5. We have had four now, two of which we're talking about in this episode, and I wouldn't be surprised if this time next year we do expand a Palooza 3 with Turmoil and probably the sixth expansion because it looks like they're going to try to put out two a year. This one is coming at Essen and it looks like it's going to be like a prelude-sized pack of cards. What we know about it is that it has corporations and project cards like usual and this new set of cards called Global Events that look like they're just going to be round events, you know, like a you flip over a card and get a new event every round, which is honestly a thing that I'm enjoying a lot in expansions these days. I'm liking having those kind of cards. You know, there's in the Quacks of Quedlinburg, they have uh, that witch card or something you flip over every round. In Altiplano, we're going to talk about in a little bit, the expansion adds in event cards. So it sounds like that's the new hot rage is add in a round event card. Okay, I'm- but that doesn't sound very tumultuous. Is there... I mean, this sounds like it's going to be a player interaction I don't, expansion. Yeah, the details on it aren't super great. It sounds like it would be that, but I think the turmoil they're saying is more like the events are going to be difficult to manage or something. Like maybe it'll burn all your plants at the end of the year or something Ooh, like that. I need or, my plants. I don't know. One of the colonies is dead. Okay, so possibly challenging event cards yeah. as opposed to boons. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to be player interaction-y yet, good. but good, then... Good, 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 good. Who knows what these additional project cards are? You know, there are some stuff in the original base box that a lot of people take out because they're too mean. Like the, what is it, the pirates or the raiders or something, sabotage. Hackers. Yeah. The hackers. Hackers. (laughs) And children workforce. So who knows? We will see more about that. It's coming at Essen. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear about expansion number six before the end of the year, because I do remember they said there were going to be six in total. So I don't know, maybe that sixth one is going to be another bigger box one like Venus or the Colonies expansion. You had actually just mentioned another game that had an expansion announced. The Quacks of Quellenberg had the Crowder Hexen expansion announced that it was going to be coming over from North Star, who brought the base game over. Mm-hmm. This should be coming out around Gen Con? Yeah, and it looks like it's adding a fifth player and also a new herb and some herbal witches. So I don't particularly know what that means yet, but more is good in Quacks of Quedlinburg to me. Yeah, and I think this is already out in Germany, but we will be very excited to add it to our copies here. Mm-hmm. No, I really enjoyed that game. It's uh, continuing to come up even after the review, which is always kind of the tell for us is if this game comes back out in our game group, if people are requesting it, it's probably a game that's going to have some staying power. So I super enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. The last one to mention, uh, Teotihuacan has an expansion called the Late Pre-Classic Period, which is a modular expansion with player powers and other words that I don't understand because I still haven't played Teotihuacan. I would Mm -hmm. kind of like to. But I was surprised to see that expansion announced so soon after that game was released here as well. So hopefully our boys over at Board and Dice have some cool ideas that they are bringing out in that. Well, I mean, at this point, if you have a lot of buzz about a game and you have an expansion that is ready to go, you better get it out while it's still Mm -hmm. rolling on that hotness. Yeah, and I feel like I'm seeing that a lot more and more with Kickstarters as well. When Seventh Continent delivered to Kickstarter backers, for example, uh, two years, a year and a half, a while ago, that was the exact same time that they launched the Kickstarter for that. We had, you know, we did our review like the day that the Kickstarter expansion was announced. I know like some of the big ones like your Kingdom Death Monsters, stuff like that. Again, as they're delivering to backers, they announce expansions and then everybody gets that again, so on and so forth, and the ball keeps rolling. That being said, we're going to talk about a game in this episode that's been out for five years and it's just getting its expansion. <laughs> so hey, you can do it however you want. Yes, but I think that that is a perfect segue to get into Kickstarters. Danielle, would you like to hit us with the giant pile of project updates? Sure. <laughs> In probably the third time I'm talking about it, Rival Restaurants from Gap Closer Games is finally completed its campaign with $305,000 of its $30,000 goal. They had 4,191 backers. They hit 20 stretch goals of content and component upgrades, and they have a wooden insert organizer available as an add-on. You can late pledge for this one, so if you are interested in the mass that is Rival Restaurants, Mm -hmm. you can still get it. Reunification, a letter-writing game about reconciliation from Travis Hill and Presspot Games, completed its campaign at $2,651 of its $500 goal, and they had 228 backers. 
The 1001 Odyssey's Kickstarter from Asmati Games completed at $188,000 of its $50,000 goal, with 2,268 backers. They unlocked three stretch goals, including a fifth storybook written by the Acquisitions Incorporated team. And you can follow along at plumplim.com, which is just a fun <laughs> website to say. Ah, oh, yay. In the Hall of the Mountain came from Burnt Island Games, completed at $285,000 of its $30,000 goal. This had 4,393 backers. It unlocked 22 stretch goals, including a solo and co-op rule set. And late pledges are also available for this one, so mm -hmm. if you are looking to back that. And finally, Wavelength from Alex Haig is funding at $218,000 of its $30,000 goal with just shy of 6,000 backers. It ends on Friday, March 8th, so if you are listening to this when it comes out, you still have about a week to back it. The stretch goals so far include component upgrades, blanks for your own spectrums, and they're probably going to unlock another expansion soon. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about Wavelength. The game just looks fantastic, and it looks like they're going to unlock that. I think it's like 45 additional spectrums for you to play around with, and there's a, a co-op rule set for it as well. So nice. yeah, super cool. Very exciting. I am going to keep it simple on this episode so we do not have a giant update mass of stuff over the next few episodes. It looks like the big Kickstarter wave is about to start hitting. So I just have two projects, one of which we have actually talked about before. Mm -hmm. And that is High Rise from Formal Ferret Games, which is relaunching today, Monday, the, what is it, 4th of March? The f yeah, that'll yeah. be the 4th of March or tomorrow. Uh, Gil's not 100% sure, but last I heard is going to be Monday. If that changes over the next 24 hours, I apologize. Yeah, if so that changes, <laughs> wait a day. Gil has reformatted the game to eliminate the stacking plastic bits that were bringing the price up, and he's actually been able to bring the backing price down to $59 on this game. It was originally $99, which was kind of the stumbling block a lot of people had with this. Personally, I loved the game, and we talked about it two episodes ago, and you can hear our thoughts on that, and also in our Gen Con episode from last year. But at $59, I think that the gameplay you're getting in this is an absolute steal. It's so much fun. It's resource collection and building, and you're building the buildings, and you're getting powers off of it, and you're getting all these other benefits, and everything you do in the game is rewarded. It's fun, and instead of stacking up a bunch of little you know, plastic pieces to build these towers. It has cardboard standees that are the different tower sizes. So as you go, you're going to be getting larger and larger cardboard standees for each of the buildings. And it still looks super cool. The art on the buildings is great. It's still Quan Chi Moria art. And uh, Heiko Gunther is doing a lot of the art and graphic design as well. So it's going to look cool. Please, high rise. Yes. I'm really glad he found a way to sort of rework this game to still keep the in interesting table presence mm -hmm. that that game had originally had with the stacking pieces, but still take into account the feedback he was getting that people just really weren't happy with that $100 price point and weren't able to back it at that. Yeah. If you are interested in this game, go check out the Kickstarter because this is a really good example of somebody taking the feedback from the community and working it into their Kickstarter to try and make everybody happy. Mm -hmm, yeah. The second one I want to talk about is Winterborn from Talent Strike Studios. This is currently funding at $21,000 of its $20,000 goal, so it just crossed in the last few days with 633 backers. This is ending on Friday, March 22nd, with an estimated delivery of February 2020. There's only one backing level for this. It is $39, and that is a really good price point for this game. It's a mid-weight Euro game with a lot of rondelle and a little bit of deck building as well. This is coming from Brian Surrey, who we've talked about a lot on the podcast before. He designed Coldwater Crown, he designed Paradox, and also has a number of other games on the way this year that I am super excited about, Winterborn being one of them. I don't want to talk a whole ton about it right now. We just actually got a preview copy of it a few days ago that we're going to talk about on the next episode, but I would encourage you to go check out this project if you've liked his previous designs. There's a really cool mechanic where you have your own personal player board that replicates a giant central player board and you're going to be playing cards out of your hand to move your three different workers around this province board and take actions. And one of the really cool things you can do is as you are taking actions, you are getting extra cards into your hand that will change the way that your workers move and also how they can move and what they can do when they get there. And you're also able to power up your personal province board with additional tiles. So as your workers move around, they have more actions available to them on each space. Super cool stuff. I love Brian Surrey's designs. Super excited to get Winterborn played so we can talk about it on the next episode. Well, awesome. I'm excited to get that to the table, and you will hear more about it in two weeks. Mm -hmm. But without any further ado, I think it is time for us to get into the reason we are here. Let's talk expansions. Well, a little bit more ado. 
But just, yeah, you know, here's here's some bump music. Want to wear your draft mechanic pride to your local brewery, board game meetup, or board game meetup at a brewery? Check out redbubble.com slash people slash draft mechanic for t-shirts. Okay, let's kick off Expandapalooza. We're going to start out with Euphoria's expansion. This is the one you were talking about earlier, taking five years between the base and the expansion. And it is called Ignorance is Bliss. Danielle, you want to hit us with the stats on this one? Sure. Euphoria Ignorance is Bliss is an expansion coming out in 2019 from Stonemaier Games that plays one to six players in 40 to 90 minutes. The designers are Morton Monrad Peterson, David J. Studley, and Nick Shaw. The artist is Jackie Davis. This is a game of dice worker placement, resource management, market building, and totally reasonable consequences. Completely reasonable. Nothing weird here. You weren't using those books. Okay, so if you haven't played Euphoria before, I'll give a quick foundation of the game so you can understand the expansion content better. This is a game of dice worker placement where you have dice, unsurprisingly, that represent your workers. You're going to roll them at the start of the game, and the numbers on those dice represent their knowledge. Knowledge is going to become important because the more workers you have and the higher numbers, aka smarter there are, you might have have a little bit of a over-smartness problem, and one of them might run away, and then you have less workers, and that's a bad thing in any kind of worker placement game. We clearly do not have an over-smartness problem. (laughs) Throughout the game, you're going to be placing your dice workers all around the board in order to gather resources, convert those resources into better resources, and then hopefully construct some markets that will allow you to place some of your authority tokens on the board. You're also going to be gathering artifact cards and fulfilling special criteria at those market spaces to place authority tokens into each of the regions of the world of Euphoria as well. The game continues until somebody places their 10th authority token onto the board, and then they get to feel like they are the smartest person in this dystopian future. They're certainly the one who is in charge. They are definitely in charge at that point. So the Ignorance is Bliss expansion has three main parts to it. First, there's some rule tweaks taking feedback over the last five years since the game came out to kind of add some balancing and also some component additions that we'll talk about as we go on. There's also the addition of an Automa, which adds two Automa players for playing with one or two players to make that two-player game feel bigger or to obviously let you play the game solo. And then also some more stuff. There's a complete new set of the market tiles that you're building that you can swap out. And there's a complete new set of the recruit cards that you can swap out as well with uh, the base game stuff. So you have a full new set of content for pretty much the most variable part of the game, which is those two sections. So I think the more stuff is really the smartest place to start, right? Mm -hmm. This is what a lot of people are going to come to this expansion for at first, because if they are fans of Euphoria and they've played it a lot, they've probably gotten used to the same market tiles and the same recruits and seeing those things come up again and again. We had an opportunity to play this with somebody who's a big fan of Euphoria, and she was super excited to see a bunch of new content right out of the gate with different recruits, different fun ways that that stuff will work together. And obviously, some of those markets have very interesting new consequences if you do not get on board. Yeah, and it's always good to just add something that's going to take a strategy that you may have refined over several years of playing this game and change what may work and what may not be as useful to do because you're getting these new powers from new markets or rather new hindrances for not contributing to new markets. And there are new recruits that you have that are going to give you a different focus on how you're going to play your game. This is going to take somebody who is really familiar with something and put them back on a level playing field with a player that is familiar with the game, but not necessarily it's coming to the table all the time for them. Mm -hmm. And the new recruits obviously give you new ways to tweak and kind of get around certain mechanics of the game. One that came up for myself and another player in one game, we both had a a way to manipulate the artifacts in fun ways. I had it so that my book could be any one of the other artifacts, which is super nice because that made it easier for me to use that artifact when I needed to put a authority token out on a particular market that I hadn't got in on or onto a, you know, an influence area that I needed to get in on as well. In addition, it also adds in some factionless recruits, which is kind of interesting. All of the recruits in Euphoria are tied to one of the four factions of the game. And as you increase those influence tracks for each of the four factions at the bottom of the board, halfway through the game, you'll be able to flip over a hidden recruit and then get a second power. If you take one of these factionless recruits, they are more powerful, but they are limited in a way that they have to be your starting recruit. You get to start with one and keep one face down for a later reveal. You can never hide the factionless recruit because there would be no way to reveal this. But they have some really cool, powerful powers as well. One of them, for example, allows you to get both a resource and an artifact card when you go to a tunnel space, which uh, the tunnels only provide both of those things instead of an either or once you've leveled up a you know one of the faction tracks to a certain level and then you have a recruit of that faction that this particular guy can get that power all the time, which is really kind of powerful to get right out the gate. 
Yeah, especially since artifact cards are going to be one of the primary ways that you're placing stars. You will place a star on a market when you build it with resources, but in order to use the market after that to place your star onto the territory, or one of the ways that you can also place a star onto a market that you haven't helped to build is by using those artifact cards. So if you're getting a lot of those, as long as you keep your hand size up, you're going to be getting a lot of resources that you can use to further your gameplay. There's another one of these factions recruits here that's once per turn after you place a worker, you can lose a heart to place another worker as if you had rolled two of a kind. So basically always saying you have got doubles from the beginning of the game. And with one of the rule tweaks in this, it already costs you a heart to place that second die on your, uh, if you roll doubles. So having this recruit, basically, you can always place another worker whenever you want just by spending a heart. That's pretty darn powerful. Well, that does mean you need to have the heart. You gotta have heart if you're gonna win. No, I don't think that's actually that's true. That's pretty much the opposite of what we're going at in Euphoria here. I'll talk really quickly about the Atoma as well. I have not had a chance to actually play with the Atoma, but I've been through the rulebook and kind of played a few one or two turns to see how it would work. It actually adds two Atoma players into the game. So at a one-player game, you can play as three players, or at a two-player game, you play as four players, uh, keeping it so you've still got a crowded board, you've still got a lot of worker interaction and a lot of bumping back and forth. The way the Atoma works is really interesting. It has a two-card setup. You have a deck of cards you set up when you begin the game that is made up mostly of the green ID cards, and you're going to shuffle that deck, flip out two of them. One of the cards is going to dictate the actions the Automa will take, while the other card will dictate the locations that their Automa are going to do those actions in. After you resolve that turn, you're going to remove the one of the cards, slide the other one over, and then draw a new card, so you get a new set of the way that those things are going to interact. As the game goes on, you're going to add in more cards that have more advanced actions in them as well, so the Automa is actually going to to mutate and change as your game goes on. Each of the four different colors of cards that this is made up of have, I think, you know, six to ten of those cards, and you're only shuffling in about a third of those cards anytime you play this game, so it's not like the Automa is going to be the same every time you play. In fact, it's going to be very different every time you play with this. I'm actually a little bit bummed that I got called away a few turns into this game because I really wanted to see how this would go, and hopefully I'll get a chance to play that again in the next few months. The other thing that the Automa adds is a timer for the game, because that Automa player is going to be placing stars in addition to the other actions that it's taking. You can't really go on forever, because mm -hmm. there is a timer that's being run by this Automa player, and eventually it will run out of stars and just win if you've been dawdling too much. <laughs> And I think that's really cool because we've played this at two players and one of the problems that I had with it was the game can be really long at two players because mm -hmm. only two people were putting their dice out to further along the tracks. That is also going to dovetail in with some of the quality of life changes that they've made. But it is cool to see this Automa, which makes a two-player game a lot more snappy. Mm -hmm gives you a lot more going on, and you're going to have to figure out how to work around all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So moving on into the final chunk of stuff here, the quote-unquote rules tweaks that are included in Ignorance is Bliss. This is actually the one that I'm most intrigued by, having played with it and comparing it back to the old version of Euphoria that we had played before. The additions are so small but so meaningful that it really impacts the way the game plays. First off, you have a few additional components. You actually get your own personal player mat, which is such a simple and nice thing to have for a game like this. You're tracking your intelligence and heart on your own personal board instead of on that shared track that always got really crowded and I felt like it was always kind of a pain to manipulate. You also have space, obviously, for your authority tokens, your resources, commodities, and your workers, so you know exactly what workers you have at any time. There's also some nice large wooden commodity tokens that count as three, which is great because then you don't have to use the kind of one, two, three resource slider tile thingy that came in the original printings of the game because you have a giant resource. You can always just, you know, trade in and out as you wish. There are stickers for the tunnels that are or each of, you know, the, the faction tunnels that will give you a different starting point depending on player count for the worker in that tunnel, which, again, like you were talking about in the two-player game, super, super helpful if that worker starts further down the tunnel and closer to its completion space in a lower player count game. It also adds in an Artifacts Bazaar, which is an additional board that sits off to the side that will impact the way that you're drawing artifacts throughout the game. In Euphoria, usually you're just drawing off the top and hoping you get what you get, and it's also going to make you have to have a bigger hand size so you can have more and you know stack a few artifacts together to mitigate that if you want to get stuff done. With the Artifact Bazaar, you have four different artifacts visible at any time. One of them is free when you have take an action that gets you an artifact. The other two cost one commodity each, and then the fourth and final one costs two commodities. When you take a commodity, everything else slides down, another one comes off the top, so on and so forth. This is really great 
And I love the way that it allows you some agency in what you're going to get, because that could have been the most frustrating thing about Euphoria if you need a pair of glasses and all you got is a whole bunch of baseball bats. Well, this meshes really well with a lot of the other improvements that were in this expansion, because like you said, a couple of those new workers allow you to use specific artifacts as wild so that they can be any of the artifacts that you need. So if I know that the player to my left really wants to get teddy bears because they're a wild for them, I may spend that extra commodity if i have it available to me to take the teddy bear that's in spot two so that that player doesn't get it and it adds a little bit of strategy there it also works well with the way that markets and territory stars work now in this expansion you no longer have to discard three artifact cards to place a star onto a market you didn't help to construct in order to be able to use that market's power you can just use the market's power to be able to place a star onto it. That means that you're going to have to have the artifact that's required to use that market. Almost all of the markets require a specific artifact. Mm -hmm. So now not only is it not as punishing to be able to place a star onto a market to then be able to place your star onto the territory, you don't need to take that extra step of discarding three random artifacts to be able to place your star onto the market, but you have the availability of four different artifacts, or up to four different artifacts, some of them may be the same, that you can choose from when you are drawing an artifact card. So if I really need a pair of glasses to be able to place my star onto the market that I was not able to help build, I can get that more efficiently instead of just keeping drawing and keeping drawing and having to discard cards that aren't useful to me to get the one that I need to be able to place onto that market. And that really sums up this entire expansion to me. This expansion is about quality of life for the gameplay. There's a lot of really great rules tweaks and component upgrades, and then the things that were added in with the more stuff give you more variability and more interesting combinations that you can play around with. Ignorance is Bliss doesn't massively change the way that Euphoria is going to work. In fact, it just does these simple tweaks that want you to get the game back out onto the table again. The things in this game that were added, and it had been a while since we had played Euphoria, Mm -hmm. just that's the nature of the podcast beast, and going back to it with this expansion, the things that I was told were new to the game were things that I would have wanted in there from the start. I, I would have assumed that the artifacts came from a market, because that is the best way for that to be done. Just drawing randomly feels less good to me. So this expansion takes Euphoria, which was a good game to start with, and gives it, I guess, the options kit, which is the the most ideal way to play this game, as far as I can tell. I really like the changes that they've made, and I would not want to play without them. Yeah. If you're already a fan of Euphoria, I think that this is a no-brainer. It's a great, solid expansion that adds just what you need to make it exactly that. I like that. Tricking it out. Giving it the, (laughs) the ST package. So if you ever listened to the podcast before, you'll know that we do an on tap every episode where we pick some beers that thematically pair with what we're talking about. So we wanted to pick a beer that thematically paired with the Ignorance's Bliss expansion for Euphoria. We've chosen to go with Blissful Ignorance Double IPA from Lupulin Brewing Company in Big Lake, Minnesota, which is just right outside the Twin Cities. It is a 9% ABV, 70 IBU double IPA that is brewed with Citra, Mosaic, and Columbus hops. It's blended to be really juicy, and it is left intentionally cloudy to create a soft mouth feel. So if you've ever had a New England IPA, this is going to be a double IPA that feels a lot like a New England IPA. Mm -hmm. It is available year-round in 12-ounce cans, so if you are up in that St. Paul, Minneapolis area, Mm -hmm. go check it out. That's really good sound in beer. <laughs> the, the New England style double IPA is like what I recommend to people that never liked IPAs before because it's not that piney, super hop bitteriness. You get a lot of that citrus and tropical flavor in there. So maybe it's the way IPA sh- could have been in the very beginning and kind of like the expansion that we just talked about. You know, something that's kind of an essential place to start if you're playing the game. And 9% ABV, it's also going to sedate your players a little bit, so... (laughs) Yes, maybe one slowly over the course of the game. All right, well, that wraps up the Ignorance is Bliss expansion for Euphoria. Let's move on to another one. Maybe one that has boats? Boats, indeed. So, Imhotep, A New Dynasty. This expansion came out in 2017 from Cosmos. Plays two to four players in 50 minutes. Designed by Phil Walker-Harding. With art by Miguel Coimbra, Martin Hoffman, Michaela Kienla and Klaus Stefan. This is a game of rocks, boats, temples, and the screwing over thereof. Indeed. So Imhotep A New Dynasty has a couple of different modules that it's going to bring to the game. 
First off, it's going to give you new location boards for each of the five different sites that you can deliver your stones to in Imhotep. Mm. In Imhotep, if you don't know how you're to play it, which you should before you buy the expansion, <laughs> um, you are taking your large stones and loading them onto boats. The boats will then deliver to one of the five sites which are available, and you will gain points by placing those stones onto whatever site you happen to have delivered your stones to with mm-hmm. that boat. Or somebody else has delivered your stones to with more, that boat. More often than not, somebody else will deliver your stones. <laughs> it's true, but you still get the points for them. So one of the main components of this expansion is they're giving you a new set of double-sided boards that gives you two new locations for each site. So there are five sites in the game. You have the market, the pyramid, the temple, the burial chamber, and the obelisks. And the initial game came with one double-sided board that gave you two variants of each location. The expansion comes with another set of double-sided boards. So now you have options A, B, C, and D for each of the locations, and you can play with any mix of them cool variety. It's more of the same. It doesn't change the game mechanics in any major way, although each of the locations that you have for each of those sites is going to give you a new way that scoring is done. That's cool. I really like the way they do that. You don't need to learn the game again, and all of the instructions for the scoring are listed on each of the locations. Mm -hmm. They're also going to give you 14 new market cards to add into your market, which is just going to add a little bit of variety. They score a little bit differently. Now, if you are playing with the expansion, you're going to keep any instant market cards because they can be useful for the prophecies, which are the third thing that this expansion is going to add in. They're going to give you seven prophecy cards that you are going to select three of if you're playing with them at the beginning of the game. And during the first two rounds, you're allowed to place out one of your tokens saying that you think you are going to fulfill one of the three prophecies. During the third and fourth rounds, you can place out a second one. And if you haven't placed out both of them by that point, during the fifth and sixth rounds, you can place out one as well. You only have two, though, so you're only going to be able to place out on two different prophecies of the three that are available. Mm -hmm. If you complete that prophecy, which is something like, you know, have the most of a certain thing, like, uh, like I said, the, the market cards, there might be like, I have the most used market cards or whatever. If you complete the prophecy, then you're going to get points at the end of the game. But if you don't complete the prophecy and you said you would, you're going to lose points at the end of the game. So you really need to hedge your bets on what you're doing. The tokens that you use to complete those prophecy or to hedge on those prophecy cards are also used in one of the locations for the market because there is a way to buy more market cards on the, I believe it's the C location for the market. So you, you're also going to get the tokens that go with that. Uh, you get a couple of other little punch board pieces to go along with this, the different locations. Like there's some scaffolding pieces that go with one of the different, I believe it's the temple or the pyramid that you can use to build the scaffolding. So there's a little bit of punch board there. There's some punch board tokens for building the obelisk on one of the new obelisks or the new tomb and a little wooden Imhotep figure and some chariots, which will be used in some of those locations as well. Other than that, I mean, the Imhotep expansion, like I said, is just going to take the game you already know how to play and give you new ways to do it. Mm -hmm. This is a really solid way to do an expansion for a a light game. One thing we really enjoyed about Imhotep when we talked about it when, I mean, I guess about two years ago now, Mm -hmm. is we were at game night, we're just sitting around, nobody knew what to play, and I just walked over to the, you know, the store's game shelf, I picked up Imhotep, and I'm like, I don't know, let's play this. You know, we've heard a lot about it, and I was able to just pick up the box and learn and play in five minutes. And it was very similar with the expansion content here. We knew the game already, we knew Imhotep, and all we really had to do was was pop out the components, look at the different boards, decide what set to use, and start playing the game like we knew, and take note of the new way that the tiles would interact. It's the perfect way to expand a light game that still gives you new, exciting variety and makes you want to play it again and again. I am interested to see how the different things interact with each other as well. If we were to use different sets of the different tiles, you know, as you get more and more comfortable with it, you can always, you know, maybe try A from here and C and D from this set, and just see what happens to see if you get some cool interesting combinations as well but it doesn't change that base game of the mechanic of filling the boats and then sending somebody's rocks where they didn't want them to go (laughs) i also like the fact that the new locations for the sites are a little bit more not i don't want to say gimmicky but they've got a little bit more table presence Mm -hmm. than the original one the one of the new obelisks you are essentially playing a tetris game and as you place your stones onto 
the obelisk track, you're getting these little tetromino pieces and you need to build them in a way that they create a solid obelisk, which looks really cool when you're placing it out on the table. There's a chariot race. So like I said, there's little chariot meeples. And as you place stones, you move your pawn mm-hmm. around. So you've got a little tiny wooden chariot race going on. The scaffolding looks really cool I to see the little the cardboard stacks and you will score those intermittently throughout the game. Whoever's got the most stones on a particular scaffold when it's completed. Even the little Imhotep that goes around the corridor and you get points for placing stones after the Imhotep meeple. But when you take an action to refill from the quarry to refill your stone blocks that you can use to place out onto boats, you can also have the option to move the Imhotep figure along so that when somebody delivers there, they're going to get a different number of points than they may have expected when they were placing their stones into the locations on that boat. So it's got a lot of things that look really fun on the table, And it doesn't really change what was already a fun game. I feel like this is how you need to do an expansion for this. Yeah, this is definitely an expansion that will continue to live in the box. There's honestly no reason to not have that stuff in there. And it's just when you're doing the setup, you decide if you're going to use, you know, A, B, and C part of it or not. So we've got a beer pairing for this one as well, correct? A taster, yes. Yes. Danielle, what is our beer? Our beer is Dynasty, because this is Imhotep, a new dynasty, Ooh. from Night Shift Brewing in Everett, Massachusetts. It is an imperial stout that is 10.6% ABV. It is Night Shift's winter stout. It's rich and full-bodied with notes of chocolate, molasses, and fig, and it is released in tall boy cans each winter. So those are the 16-ounce cans that you see around. Yes. And Night Shift makes some very tasty stout, so I'm... I'm very much a proponent of this one. Yeah, it's funny because they're a brewery that I generally think of for IPAs and also for sours, but their stouts absolutely are worth your attention. And I'm a little bummed that we are not up in Massachusetts to get our hands on this one because it sounds very good. Mm. I mean, Awake is probably one of my favorite beers that they make, and that's a dark beer. But this is not that. This is Dynasty. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that is Imhotep, A New Dynasty. Thanks so much to Cosmos for sending a copy of that over to us. Uh, Really good expansion and worth having if you have Imhotep. Imhotep. Third up, we have the new expansion for 5-Minute Dungeon. This is Curses, Foiled Again, the 2018 release from Wiggles 3D. Yes, Wiggles 3D. Two to six players, plays in, what a surprise, five minutes. This is designed by Connor Reed with art by Alex Diocon, with real-time card play, symbol matching, and an unending maze of puns. Did you have quite a few puns? There are immeasurable puns. So in Curses, Foiled Again, They have added a couple of new things. Again, there's a couple of different additions that come in this very small expansion box. There are two new cards for each of the five decks that came in the original game. Mm -hmm. So just adding a little bit more variety to those decks and making them work with the new cards. There is a sixth player, which is going to add a black player color. And that deck is not specialized in the way the initial five decks were specialized, but it does have some really interesting cards in it that... When you play them out, they count for any number of symbols of that type. So if you put an infinite scroll out, it's all the scrolls on the current door, including even the boss card. So you could play one of these infinity cards at the end of the game if you've still got it in your hand, and it's going to count for a whole bunch of symbols. That's a big scroll. It also has obviously new player powers as they all have different player powers. So this is now a two to six player game. The other thing about player count that they've added in is these artifact cards. And there is one artifact for each player color. And once you've decided what players are going to be playing in the game, whichever player colors you don't have in the game, you're going to put their artifacts out. And it is a one-time use card that gives you sort of a power that goes with that player's deck. So like the red one allows you to defeat a monster, which is what the red player would have been really good at. Mm. But since he's not in the game, you have that sort of that compensation. In a two-player game, each player is going to be playing two heroes, so you would still only get two of those artifact cards. Okay. And also, those artifact cards are super shiny. They are also very shiny. They're foiled. <laughs> they are. Again. The puns. Terrible. They've also changed the way that the bosses work in this game, and this is where the name of the expansion comes from, the curses. Each of the bosses has five boss cards that you are going to be shuffling into their dungeon deck when you're creating the deck at the beginning of the round. And those things are going to have effects that are specific to that particular boss, including some of them, which are curses. These are cards that when you flip them up, they're going to stay on the table and they're going to persist until they are cleared. The black player has a power that, at least on one of the sides of their player board, allows them to clear curses by discarding their hand. But the deck for that player also has some cards that allow them to clear curses that just you play the card and that gets rid of it. Nice. Some of these are simple mechanical things, like you can't have more than three cards in your hand, and some of them are wacky, crazy things, like you can only say waffles in the game. 
And I believe there are two cards that allow you to only say Waffles, so you'd have to clear that Waffles curse twice. Hmm. This gives each boss a little bit more personality because it's not just a random deck. It is stuff that goes specifically with that boss coming up throughout the dungeon. And you're going to play through just like you would normally in the game where you go through and you're trying to clear obstacles by playing cards into the center once they're played. Even if they are overplayed on the amount that you needed, they're going to be discarded and you're trying to clear all of the obstacles in the dungeon and defeat the boss before everybody runs out of cards. And in less than five minutes, because it's called Five Minute Dungeon. <laughs> this is not Six Minute Dungeon. So Five Minute Dungeon has always been a light, quick, you know, filler kind of game at our game nights. The curses thing that it adds in here is pretty much our biggest feature here. Does it feel like it's too much, or is it a good addition into the game? Well, see, the curses always seemed like, it seemed like a better idea than it actually ended up being in the gameplay to me. Yeah. Because a lot of the times, it was just a hindrance that you didn't remember why it related to the boss. It was just like a thing you had to remember. And the violation penalty for the curse is if you break whatever the curse is, you have to discard your entire hand into the middle, which means it gets cleared when that obstacle gets cleared, Ooh. not going into your discard pile. Yikes. So it took what was like kind of a goofy game and gave it a little bit more stakes, which I guess is good for some people, but wasn't really what I wanted. Yeah. My favorite part of this game is actually, well, in idea my favorite part is the artifacts okay i like the idea that if you're playing with a smaller group you still have the flavor of those characters that you didn't bring along with Mm -hmm. you i like that but at the same time when we are playing through the game because this game is so fast paced and you're always trying to keep track of what other people are doing making sure you don't throw in cards that have already been covered nobody really paid attention to the artifact cards in our games because there wasn't time Hmm. you'd essentially have to look at them when you paused the game, and there is a curse that allows you not to pause the game. And you'd have to sort of strategize at that point. But especially if you're playing with people who are not in a really good rhythm with this game, who've not played it a ton before, there's not really the time to go to those artifact cards and be like, oh, grab it. I mean, I very rarely even have time to play the cards that I have that are like (laughs) clear a monster or clear an obstacle or whatever. Because by the time you look at the thing that's in the center, see what type of obstacle it is, then look at the cards in your hand. Somebody's already played some cards out and you don't want to waste those cards. So it does definitely... It shines as an idea, but it's not something that came up a lot for us. Yeah. I think adding a six player for this is always good because getting more people in on the fun is fine. And the way they balanced it is good. They already had decks that were strong on each of the different types of cards that are in the deck. So you already had the ranger who's good at archery and the barbarian who's good at sword fighting and everything like that. So when they added a six player, they didn't weight it towards one. They just made it good at everything. But you have sort of an analysis paralysis when you're trying to play those infinity cards because do I use this card that could be, I mean, it could be seven scrolls on the boss, but if I play it now, it's only going to be two. Hmm. And in that minute that you're thinking about that, somebody's already played out one scroll and you're like, well, now it's only one. What do I do? <laughs> and then somebody plays another card that clears it and you're like, oh, well. Yeah. So it, it sounds to me like this is an expansion that is more for people who have played Five Minute Dungeon a lot and are looking to make it more challenging, like, you know, a group who's really gotten into a good rhythm and knows how each of those is going to work. Yeah, certainly. The curses do that. They will add a little bit of a challenge. And if you've played through a ton of times and you've seen all of the funny events and you've gotten really good at using the player powers, curses are going to make it a little bit more challenging because Mm -hmm. they are going to add those permanent hindrances. And I do think that giving the bosses a little bit of their own character is interesting. I wouldn't say that this is a must-buy expansion unless you routinely want to play this with six. Okay. But it is a fun expansion. Like, I don't dislike having it, and I wouldn't necessarily take it out. But I'm not sure this is one that you need to pick up just because you have the base game. Gotcha. And especially if you back the very first edition Kickstarter like we did, you will have different size cut cards, which is a huge bummer. I mean, it's a bummer, but this game moves so quickly and you have very little like control over what you're drawing off the top of the deck. Mm, true. I initially, when I was shuffling the decks together, was really bummed. I was like, oh, the cards, you can tell which are the, the new expansion cards. I never thought that when I was playing the game, though, because yeah. I was thinking about so many other things in real time hmm. that the fact that I had an expansion card coming up didn't even cross my <laughs> mind until I saw it. Well, that's good. Do you want to tell us about our taster beer for this one? You know, maybe I think I will. 
So we have a beer from True Brewing Company in Denver, Colorado, and that is True, T-R-V-E, in case you are searching for it on the, the internet. But you, you don't need to search. Just go to draftmechanic.net, click the show notes. Danielle does all that work <laughs> so that you can click links really easily. Anyway, True Brewing has a beer called Cursed. It is a sour ale, 4.5% ABV. This is the well-described mixed culture sour pale ale. One good thing about this is that this was something that was an occasional in bottles and is now part of their core lineup, and it is available regularly in tall boy cans. Mm. I've always really liked True Sours, so the fact that it just says mixed culture, sour pale ale, we have had it before. It is tasty. It is those words, and you'll get a nice sour, funky flavor to it. Nice. Cool. But don't put it too close to your five-minute dungeon game, because you will knock it over while you're trying to reach for that (laughs) artifact if you have them out in the game. Very true. Yes, very true brewing. Oh, good one. I didn't even... Okay. It's not good. (sighs) I need to take a break after that fantastic pun. Boo. (laughs) Okay, we're going to take a break and come back with our other two and or three expansions. Hey, Jake, have you ever wondered what would happen if the moon, which was actually an ancient dragon god that was all riled up because warriors were trying to get rid of the gods, crashed into the Pacific Ocean and opened a rift that put humans in a post-apocalyptic state and mutated all the animals to have crazy abilities? Um, I can't say I've had exactly that thought. Well, in Tsukuyumi, you and your friends will take the role of soldiers and giant boars, a robot army, mutated roaches, and the descendants of ancient dragon slayers, each using your own abilities to bid for opportunities to accomplish your, you know, moon goals. And when can I accomplish these moon goals? Gray Fox Games is bringing Tsukuyumi to Kickstarter in mid-March 2019, so keep your eye out lest you anger the dragon moon god further. Gray Fox Games, quality games cleverly crafted. Okay, the next expansion we have is the expansion for Altaplano. This is Altaplano the Traveler, which came out in 2018 from Renegade Games and DLP Games. It plays two to five players in 60 to 120 minutes. <coughs> no, it doesn't. It does not, no. The designers are Reiner Stockhausen and Louis and Stefan Maltz. The artists are Clement Franz and Jeff Oglesby. This is a game of bag building, resource trading, contract fulfillment, and alpaca stability. Yes. In the Altaplano, the Traveler expansion, you'll be excited to see that they have replaced the three-part alpaca that is your first player marker and constantly falls apart with a single piece of punch board for the alpaca start player thingy. Less alpaca (laughs) body horror. There is also other stuff in this expansion, which I will describe after just reminding you how Altaplano plays. So Altaplano is a bag builder where you're going to be drawing little goods tokens out of your bag, and you're going to be placing them on your personal player board to activate actions all over the different spots in the... um, Alpacaverse? Yeah, the Alpacaverse. Uh, The main board of Altaplano is seven different region tiles, and each of them is tied to a part on your personal player board that if your player meeple is on a specific place in the Alpacaverse, is what we're going to call it from here on out, (laughs) then you are allowed to use good tokens on your personal player board to then get better goods tokens and also fulfill contracts and get other benefits and all this stuff. You're, you're engine building and bag building with the goal of, unsurprisingly, getting a lot of points. So much good conversion. So the Traveler expansion adds in, unsurprisingly, a number of different modules that you can play with. This is kind of the theme of expansions these days, is here's four or five different things that we're putting in rather than just one big thing. But it does have a new tile that is going to go in the center of your alpaca verse. Instead of just having the circle of seven things and you put all your food and money tiles in the middle, you have to move all of that to the side to plop down a new market that is going to go in the middle. The market is not a location you're going to actually go to, but it's going to be a spot that you are sending goods to as you take actions with the Traveler throughout the game. The Traveler is a new pawn that is going to go around the Alpacaverse, kind of clockwise from place to place, and if you go to a tile that has the Traveler on it, you then have a new set of actions available to you via a new tile that's going to be basically on the top or bottom of your personal player board. This is going to allow you to trade goods tiles to that center board for opals, which are your typical acrylic little diamonds, but they're pink in this one. Mm -hmm. And you can use those to get other people's goods that they've traded for other things off of that central board. But why would you want to do this trading, you may wonder? 
why would I want to do this trading, I wonder? Well, I'm glad you asked, because when you do this trading and you take these traveler actions, you are able to trade goods to the center in order to get these asset cards. Asset cards are kind of the big useful feature of the traveler expansion. They're going to be additional buffs that you get that allow you to manipulate your goods and other things in fun ways. For example, I had one that made purchasing the extension tiles one coin cheaper. Uh, Daniel had one that made purchasing assets give him a point. Mm -hmm. And there's a few others in there that allow you to manipulate stuff in fun ways. Mine was whenever I took any action on the space the traveler was at, I got a dollar, which allowed me to have a nice flow of money throughout the game. Ooh, a dollar. Mm -hmm. Another nice feature of the Traveler expansion is that it adds in this event deck, which we talked about earlier on for what expansion was that for uh, the terraforming mars expansion in the super early part of this episode how every turn or every round of the game you're going to flip over one of these event cards and they're going to be generally some kind of a buff i think there was one that was like spend a coin to get a cart or everybody can move themselves down the road to get you know one more on their draw level so on and so forth the deck of these is constructed in an interesting way you have an a b c d and e set and you're uh, shuffling the each of those letters individually and then stacking up a deck so that you're going to get to three of the a cards and three of the B cards and then the C's and D's and then all of the E's go in. So you're going to get variability in that deck, but it's still going to progress in a specific way so that some of the most powerful events, the E stuff, comes out near the end of the game rather than just shuffling a whole deck and who knows what's going to happen. That's similar to the way that they have the extensions board set up where you have A, B, C, and D sections so that you get the stuff that is helpful at the beginning of the game at the beginning of the game and you get the stuff that you can't use until you've gotten a b bunch of your engine working at the end of the game. So I like the way that they kept that consistent. It also obviously adds in some other cards that are going to be in the missions kind of set, which is a set we've honestly never played with when we did Altiplano for a review. They're just basically private goals that give you special stuff. But there's a bunch more of those obviously dealing with the assets and with trading and things along those lines. So those are your primary things you're adding in with the Traveler. And it's not going to add another player, thankfully. It's not going to change anything special. Else, uh, it does include a variant for a shorter game as well, where you all start with an additional food tile and you also start with one more token draw. So your engine starts a little bit faster. It's kind of like in Terraforming Mars when you start with one production instead of zero. The game for us, we played with three players with the expansion. It still took two and a half hours. And that's three players who knew how to play Altiplano. Yeah, and that was... I started the timer after we did the teaching part of it, too. I don't understand who's getting this game under two hours. And frankly, I don't have a problem with that. I enjoy playing Altiplano. I enjoyed it a lot when we reviewed it about this time last year. And the Traveler expansion adds enough fun stuff that I can play with, but I'm not forced to use it, that I still want to play it. But I don't understand what this two-hour playtime is. People must be blazing through this game and just taking everything and ending the game as fast as possible. Well, even with a higher player count, it scales so there's more items that are placed out in each of the different piles. So one of the ways that you can end Aldeplano is clear off one of the locations of all of its cards and tokens and cubes and whatever happens to be on it, clear it entirely. Mm -hmm. But as you add more players, you add more items to each of those locations other than cards. So maybe in a five-player game, you could clear like the house and wagon thing quicker? I don't I know. Guess. But nobody's playing this in 60 minutes. Which no. <laughs> That'd be great. Like, honestly, if this game played in 60 minutes, I would play it a lot more, probably. I don't think I would, because I like the full game. True, But true. let's talk about the new stuff. Okay, so the new stuff. I super enjoyed all of the stuff in this expansion, primarily because I was allowed to use it, but never forced to use any of it. So I guess we can kind of just go by them one by one. Uh, maybe start with the trading itself. How did that feel for you, trading out the goods and stuff to the middle? I really liked it, because it allowed you to get goods that other players might have taken early in the game because either they wanted to keep you from having them or they just took them because they thought their engine would go in a specific way and it mm -hmm. ended up not. Because those goods that are no longer useful to a player are likely to be what they trade to the trader to get that trader action. And then they're going to be in the center board. So like I was playing a heavy house strategy in our game, which you get points for having different types of goods. And I had almost all of them. <laughs> we kind of let you run away with the houses on that for sure. It's true, but you had taken a bunch of the Karen tokens, with mm -hmm. the stacked rocks tokens, because they were useful to your engine. But towards the end of the game, they stopped being particularly useful, and there were a bunch of them in the center board mm -hmm. because they had been traded for the trader actions to get those asset cards or tie their 
their cards. cards. Yeah. And I was using the trader action not necessarily to get the asset cards, but just to get those resources which had been discarded to the trader so that I could collect them and I could put them into my points for my houses. You could also do that if you are working on a warehousing strategy mm-hmm. to get stuff that is on your higher point warehouse shelves. Yeah. And I like the idea that you can use a resource for a little while and then get rid of it so A, your bag is called down, mm-hmm. and B, other players can then take those resources and use them in ways that work for their strategy towards the end whereas they may have worked for yours towards the beginning. Yeah, this is something that came super useful for me because I was the person focused on the warehouse strategy. And the stuff that I had put in my very top two rows, I didn't have enough of, and they were all gone. But thankfully, like you said, there was Karen in the center, so I was able to trade for that and get those stones and fill up my top two rows, which is always really fun and exciting when I'm able to do that. The asset cards that you get were Mm -hmm. also a nice bonus. They give you additional points and additional resources throughout the game. They give you a little bit more options and flexibility, but you don't need to get them. In our game, I only, like I said, I only got one of those asset cards, and I was definitely competitive. I was not, I was in the middle of our game and the scoring. So you can play with them, and if you get the right ones, they can be really useful. They are strong powers, but at the same time, If you don't focus on doing that, there are definitely ways to utilize the other parts of the expansion and the base game to still be a competitive player. Another thing I really enjoy about the asset cards is the way that you choose what you get. All of the decks pretty much in Altiplano, any of the cards in that deck are available at any time. For example, the boats and the houses, you can choose which one you want to get when you take that action. And the assets are the same way. It's not like you have three that are available to pick from at any given time. You have a a deck of level one and a deck of level two and the level one ones are available all the way throughout the game and whenever you go to get an asset you can choose which card you want to get and then in the c set of events cards it will flip up the level two asset cards and then you have all of the asset cards to choose from another thing super helpful is that they give you a player aid that tells you what every single one of them does so everybody can just look at their own player aid throughout the game and see what assets are available and what other players have without having to be like yo tell me what your your thing over there does i need to see that card so i can know what i'm doing or having somebody grab the whole stack and just kind of thumb through them other than to see what is available a really really great production choice there thank you so much for including a player aid instead of just burying it in the back of a rule book I also like the fact that the resource that you use for the trader actions, that opal, Mm -hmm. is different enough that it reminds you that you have it and that you can use it. Yeah. Because there are a ton of tokens in this game. Like, you are wealthy with cardboard. (laughs) It would have been very easy for them to make the cardboard tokens and then they would have sort of gotten lost on the stuff in front of you because there's not really a home for your opal. Yeah, it just kind of sits. It's like the money, it just kind of sits to the side. But the money is a different shape, and that reminds you that it is not one of your round tokens, and which are the goods. Mm -hmm. And the opal is that three dimensional little pink gem. And it reminded me, like, oh, if I'm on the traveler action, I might be able to spend this to to buy one of the things from the center board. Whereas normally it might not have popped out. It's it's a silly thing that I'm happy about, but it's a good production choice in my opinion. I think that you can really say that about a lot of things in Altaplano. You know, that's one thing we have talked about in the prior review is that coins can never go in your bag and they're cut differently. They're not just another circular token. The opals, there you go. It's a, another different kind of thing. I love all of the different production choices that were made in Altaplano and the Traveler does it just as well. Anything that is different is distinct enough from other things that it's kind of like so that you never have to worry about it. Along with that, the iconography is super, super strong to the point where we hadn't played Altaplano really in a year, probably. And with, you know, I was able to read the rule book in about five to 10 minutes for this expansion. And after a quick reminder of, okay, so this is our turn sequence. This is how this is going to, you know, progress. Here's the end conditions. We were able to pick up the game and get going in 15 minutes with this new expansion. And I think that the iconography is a strength of that. You are shaking your head? No, I'm just shaking my head because it's been like six months. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even play it a year ago. We played it in May of last year. Oh, I guess year. we did. We played that a bunch at uh, Geekway. And it is a fun game, but I agree with you. It was very easy to pick back up. And I mm-hmm. like that the things that were more complicated, which are those asset cards, had a full written description that everybody had access to at all times. You yeah. didn't have to try to guess based on the iconography. And additionally, the asset cards are cards instead of tiles like the extensions. So even though you've got a bunch of rectangular stuff sitting in front of you, you're not going to mix them up. 
Speaking of cards, how do you feel about the event cards in this expansion? It's perfect. I love it. Um, I am starting to realize that I just love having event cards. I think that having a new event every round is a great way to spice up a game and make it exciting. I love them in Quacks of Quedlinburg, for example, and I'm actually really excited to see them in Terraforming Mars when the Turmoil expansion comes out, assuming, of course, that they are good and not crappy and, you know, blow up all your stuff cards. Well, I think it's important that these are all positive event cards. Yes. They could have put negative event cards in here, and in this type of game, that would have been a problem for yeah. me. Because so much of this game is about getting the correct resources and making sure that you have everything you need and that it's going to come out at the time that you need it, mm -hmm. if it had been hindrances, I don't think I would have liked the event cards at all. But because they are sometimes boons, sometimes they're just good stuff that you get, mm -hmm. and they are sometimes choices that you have to make. Do you want to trade money for a cart? Do you want to trade a food for something else? It's a fair trade, but it's a choice you have to make. And sometimes you do want that and sometimes you don't want that. But none of it is like discard a tile yeah. or, or an extension rather, or discard a resource. They're all benefits. And I think because this is such a calculated Euro game, that was a good choice. I guess another point for us to talk about is the way that the traveler moves. And this is going to be kind of one of the things that is impacted by player counts. So like I said, you have a traveler pawn that's going to be moving around your alpacaverse and hitting up all of the seven tiles. It starts on the road and then moves clockwise, but it moves clockwise to the next space that is not occupied by any player pawn. So choosing your sequence of actions is going to be even more important than base altiplano because where your pawn rests at the end of the round is going to determine where that traveler can move. And if you need that traveler to be on a certain space on the next round, maybe you want to change the order in which you do stuff. It's an interesting little piece of the puzzle that I didn't really even notice until about halfway through the game. But especially at a five pl player game, that's going to become a huge part of the strategy, I think. Yeah, certainly. And there are some asset cards that allow you to move after you pass so you can manipulate the way that that traveler is going to move. I think it also means that the traveler is never going to just go through a section where it specifically helps one player because it's the zone that that player is focused in. Since your tiles in the alpaca verse are randomly placed in that circle, if the traveler moved just one tile every time, it's entirely possible that like, if you are at the end of that loop, if that's the section that applies to your strategy, you would have to wait until you could take those additional traveler actions and that would hinder you. But because the traveler skips over anywhere that anybody is, so essentially the things that are most impactful to their strategy, mm -hmm. you're gonna need to actually make the effort to make sure you visit the traveler to get that benefit. And everybody's going to have to think about like, okay, I need to make sure I get to that spot. Maybe I don't need fish from the fish tile, but is it worth going over there to take these traveler actions to get that bracelet that's in the center that I really need? Yeah, I found myself several times throughout the game looking at the traveler and looking at its path and saying, okay, can I make something useful out of that space while the traveler is there? Which is exciting because when we played the base game, there were often times where I'm like, I'm never going to go to this particular tile because it's useless to me. And having that as something to think about was another fun wrinkle. It also made you think about whether or not you were going to use extra cards that you had purchased. Mm -hmm. Because especially if you have an asset card that gives you a benefit for taking an action on the Traveler, and there were at least two. There was one that gave you a point and one that gave you money. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's worth spending that food as a cart propulsion instead, or even as just a single food movement to be able to do a traveler action and get the money or point that you're going to get for it instead of spending the food on another action maybe later down the road. I guess to start wrapping it up, I'm always a little concerned adding in expansions that add, you know, a bunch of new mechanics to a midweight Euro because it's a game that I've already gotten a good feel of and I know how everything works together and I, I don't want it to upset the balance of the gameplay too much. But the Traveler did a really great job integrating new ideas and new mechanics without overpowering anything and not forcing you to completely change your strategy, but rather giving you options to enhance your existing strategies. The asset cards that I picked and you picked and Daniel picked all fit what we were working on in our particular games already rather than forcing us to go completely off the rails in a different direction. And that's a really good way to to do an expansion for a midweight euro like this. I agree. Normally when I'm adding an expansion into a game that I understand the strategy of and that already has a lot of systems in place, I am hesitant to use a lot of the new stuff. But this game, every turn, I felt myself examining the new stuff equally with the, the original base game stuff. And I really like that. We talked at the end of our game of this about 
whether or not you would play this with new players. And I think we all agreed we wouldn't necessarily add it in with people who had not played Altiplano before. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be playing your copy of Altiplano with new people all the time, you may not need to pick this one up. But we all said that if somebody had played it once before, this is an expansion we would want to add in. We enjoyed what it brought to the game. And once you've got the base mechanics of how the game works, it isn't too much of an extra step to add in this new stuff. Yeah. And frankly, if you weren't a huge fan of Altiplano before, I don't think this is going to add enough to make you suddenly love the game. But if you were on the fence and kind of enjoyed it, I feel like you would get more actions and more fun that would take it up to that next step for you. Mm -hmm. I still don't understand why this game takes us two and a half hours to play, though. Okay. (laughs) Okay, so moving on, we've got a beer, a taster on tap for this one as well. Danielle? This is from Adelbert Brewery in Austin, Texas, and it is Traveling Man, because... You're adding the Traveling Man to your your game of Altiplano. Yeah. It is an American IPA that is 6.2% ABV and 55 IBU, and it is a soft, juicy flavor bomb of an IPA. They rotate the hops from batch to batch, and they have just, I think they've just recently made this a regular beer that they're brewing. They had done individual batches one off, but now this is part of their canned lineup. Nice. So 12 ounce cans available. If you are in the Austin area, go check it out. Traveling Man. All right, well, let's close out Expandapalooza with two expansions for one game. For Terraforming Mars, that is. Mm -hmm. We have Terraforming Mars Prelude and Terraforming Mars Colonies. Both came out in 2018 from Stronghold and Frick's Games. They would both play one to five players in 120 minutes. The designer is Jacob Frixelius, and the artist is Isaac Frixelius. This is a game of Mars making, card engine building, tree putting, asteroid crashing, and heat having. Yes, and then using that heat and other resources to the benefit of Mars. One of these is also a game of little tiny plastic spaceships. Those are fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have talked about terraforming Mars a significant amount throughout the years. We've reviewed it. We talked about the Hellas and Elysium expansion. We talked about Venus Next as well. And now I'm going to talk about two expansions, but not at the same time. I'll just go through each of them very quickly. So terraforming Mars, obviously card playing engine building game where you are terraforming Mars over generations. You're playing cards out of your hand and using the six different resources available to you to do things that make your engine better in order to get a bunch of points and also place tiles out on Mars. Prelude, the first expansion we're going to talk about, comes in at the beginning of the game, and this is a set of cards that give you variable starting position stuff. In addition to your corporation, you're also going to take four of the Prelude cards from the deck. You shuffle off the deck and everybody gets four, and you're going to choose two of them to be your Prelude card. And all of them are going to give you different advantages or benefits. There are some that are persistent. There's some that give you special, you know, resources you start with or give you a special fun way that you can manipulate a resource, something like that. But it just basically diversifies your starting point a whole lot. In addition to that, you also get five new corporation cards and I think seven new project cards that are thematically appropriate for the beginning of terraforming. Cool. Unsurprisingly, new corporations are going to be true in every one of these expansions. And frankly, that's pretty much everything that's in Prelude. It's a very small box expansion, and it just gives you some little boosts at the start. Colonies is the other expansion, and it's one of the bigger box ones like Venus Next. In this, you get, obviously, a bunch of project cards. You get five new corporations, but the main feature of Colonies is... I know this is going to be surprising to you, the colonies. You get these tiles that represent colonies. You're putting out a certain number for players, and you're going to be interacting with these in fun and exciting ways for you to build colonies on these colony tiles and also trade, quote-unquote, with those colonies to get resources in exciting new ways. Using little plastic spaceships. The little plastic spaceships are fun. So the way it will work is you have a new standard project that is establishing a colony. For a certain amount of mega credits, you can establish a colony onto one of those colony tiles. You place one of your cubes that are, you know, cubes used for everything onto that tile, and it will give you basically a colony there. And there's another action that you will be taking throughout the game that allows you to produce or trade with one of those colonies. When you trade, when you take the action to trade, you will get some kind of a trade bonus, but then everybody else who is also has a colony on that tile will get a production bonus off of that colony as well. So basically what the colonies are going to do is give you another way to gain resources 
through different manipulation of putting your colonies out there and also moving your trade ships around and hopefully getting the things that you need. All of them kind of scale up as well. At the end of each round, the cube that is kind of the trade bonus goes up by one. So if you don't trade with it over a few generations, it's going to get higher and higher and higher, making it more lucrative and encouraging you to take that action to go over there and get those resources more. Some of them also give you, I think there's one that gives you cards, uh, gives you card draws. And also I think there's one that gives you production if you go there, or that's the bonus for when you place your colony on there. Each of the colonies can only support three colony cubes, a max of one from each player, unless there is a special card that allows you to place more than one on a particular colony. So those first three spaces all have a bonus for placing a colony, and some of them are just straight resources, some of them are production. But once those cubes are there, it will permanently increase the minimum trade value of that colony, so it is encouraged for you to get out there and then continue taking those actions. All in all, the colony's expansion adds a useful new function that allows you to trade and get resources in a fun new way. It honestly was the one that I'm most excited of of the four that we've had so far. I think the colonies add a really interesting and useful resource production aspect, particularly if you don't play Terraforming Mars with drafting. Mm -hmm. We obviously recommend that you do play Terraforming Mars (laughs) with drafting, but if you don't play it with drafting, you are now able to get resources that you might not have been able to get to make the cards that you get in each of your hands more valuable to you. Now, that comes at a cost that you may be providing people who have colonies on that location with additional resources also, but it is often very worth it to be able to get the thing that you need to make your engine work right now and maybe give somebody else a benefit, a little bit of a bonus for having a production colony there. I will say it took a minute for me to figure out how the colonies worked as well. You know, I sat there for probably 20 minutes with the rule book. It wasn't the clearest thing in the beginning, but once we got one or two turns in and saw how the cubes moved up and how, you know, production moves up until you actually go there to trade, then it made a lot of sense. And by mid-game, we were pretty bustling on those colonies. Everybody wanted to get in on those. I don't think anybody didn't use a colony in the five-player game we played of this with um, with all that new stuff, which is good because it's useful, but not mandatory. Certainly. And not every colony is going to come out every game, so it's not going to become samey with those. You're going to have to make decisions about what cards you are keeping and what corporations you're choosing, even what prelude cards you're choosing, if you're playing with prelude as well, Mm -hmm. based on the colonies that are in this particular game and what additional resources you can or cannot get very easily by doing a trade with a colony. It is a really good point, and I feel like we can kind of segue into a, a grand talk about terraforming Mars here, specifically with the concept of bloat. Because... Colonies includes a good number of new project cards and um, five new corporation cards to the point where when we played this, we gave everybody one Prelude Corporation and one Colonies Corporation and said, you get to pick which one you want to do. But I'm worried that this card pool is going to get diluted, especially if you continue to add more and more content. If this Turmoil expansion adds more project cards and then whatever the sixth expansion adds a bunch of new project cards, you're going to get to the point where you've got like a 300, 350 card deck. We're already there. And it's just going to be, is it going to be too much to manage? I think that it is becoming actually better than it was at the point where we had like the Venus Next cards that were added. Venus Next also added a major injection of project cards to the deck. But at that point, it had added this new, uh, what is it? The floaters. The floater resource. And they've continued to use that. So that is now relevant to a couple of different expansions. I know Colonies and Prelude both have things that apply to that floater resource. Yeah. But when we had initially added that in, it did feel kind of dilute. Like you might not see that floater resource at all, or you might see it maybe once or twice, and then it's not terribly useful. Mm -hmm. But I think the expansions going forward from there have moved away from adding in new stuff and have, like I said, continued to utilize resources that they added in that Venus Next expansion. So the fact that they're adding new cards is actually making the deck work better together, particularly if you're playing it with drafting where you can choose what you keep and what you pass on to other players because they are making a greater percentage utilizing stuff that they've added already. Okay. So instead of maybe seeing two Venus cards throughout the whole game, you may see 10 cards that are from Venus and also from Colonies and your starting Prelude cards that apply to a particular resource that they've added. As long as they don't at this point decide like, oh, we need 
another new resource, <laughs> in which case they'll bring it back down to where you have a fairly dilute pool for that resource. If they stick with what they've got, I think we're just making actually a stronger deck. I'm wondering your thoughts on this. With four expansions out right now, what is your ideal setup for Terraforming Mars? What would you include and what would you not? I would not play with Prelude without something else, which is, since we've been talking mostly about colonies and Prelude around here lately, that's the, my first thought. I enjoy what Prelude gives you, that variable starting setup, and the fact that when you start with four of those Prelude cards, everybody has a good number of variable starts that they can have. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily think that I would want to have a jump start if I'm not playing with any of the other stuff to, to start the game. Okay. We don't play with one production when we start. We always start at zero production. Like you, I feel like it's fun to grow your engine from nothing if you're not doing all these other things. Yeah. I liked Colonies with Prelude, though, and I would probably always play Prelude if I were playing Colonies because I like the thought at the beginning where you have your corporation cards, you have your prelude cards, you have the colonies that are available in the game, and you have your starting hand, and you're trying to find what the best combination of all of that packed together into a nice tight package can be. Mm -hmm. I really like that combination. I don't love the new board that much. Like, I, I could take or leave the new board. The Hellas and Elysium stuff? E yes, the yeah. Hellas and Elysium stuff. I could take or leave Venus. Honestly, I don't dislike it as much as I know you do. You're not crazy about Venus. I think Venus for me just felt like a thing that existed rather than a thing that I wanted to do. It was just another track that I slid up. It didn't feel full. It didn't feel like a fully fleshed out thing. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So that, that's, I guess, why I could take or leave it. If yeah. we needed to play with it, that's fine. And there are certainly corporations in there that I would want to keep into the deck. So, you know... It's not as essential as maybe I would say colonies is a fun thing that I would want to add a lot. Yeah. But it's fine. I really enjoyed the setup with colonies and Prelude. Kind of the same thing you say. I feel like they worked well together. I'm a big fan of the Hells and Elysium boards. I don't always want them, but just the fact that they have different milestones makes it exciting for me. I think we also are just very set with the baseboard milestones and that we know them and we, you know, we know exactly what we want to build towards. Obviously, if you have a different set of milestones and awards on each of those different boards, you're going to have something you've got to think that's way different than what we were used to planning. So that will also go into your setup. The other part about all of this that I found interesting goes back to what you said a few times is that I now am choosing between corporation cards and prelude cards and my starting hand of 10 because you get all of them at the same time. It adds a lot more on the front end of this game than I was expecting. I don't like I, I didn't really think about it and I didn't expect it to be a lot, but it really gives you a lot more things to think about at the beginning. So the point that we're spending 15 to 20 minutes before we even get playing the game, which may or may not be a good thing. It can it depends on your personal enjoyment of a long terraforming Mars game. We like a long terraforming Mars game. Mm hmm. The other thing is, like, the other game that jumps to mind for me when you talk about looking at your cards at the beginning of the game and planning out your whole game before you even start playing mm -hmm. is Agricola. Mm, okay. A lot of people who, t who play Agricola regularly will say, okay, you get your hands of card and you, you are essentially planning out your whole game before you do anything because you need to know what cards you're going to keep and what, what you're going to work with. I don't think Terraforming Mars locks you in that firmly. Like, you can definitely direct your gameplay with the stuff you pick at the beginning of the game. But if you need to pivot, I think you can still pivot in a game and still be a competitive player. Hmm. Like, if somebody else is going to play a card that either exceeds you or hinders your production in some way that you were not expecting, you can still do useful things because there is so much available in Terraforming Mars because you do have so many crazy resources and cards and <laughs> locations and things that you can do, I think it is still a planning phase and not necessarily the whole game being played before you start. One of the really unfortunate things that I do want to say, and I hate having to say it, is that I would say the best way to buy Terraforming Mars is to buy all of Terraforming Mars. Yeah. With the exception of possibly the Hellas and Elysium board, which doesn't add any extra cards, even Venus Next, like I said, that deck has become better for having all of the resource cards and cards that interact with different resources in it. Mm -hmm. So as much as I hate to say, like, go out and spend, what, like 70 bucks for the base game, uh -huh. and then... You're probably looking about 200 bucks here total. Yes. And normally I would be like, hmm, that's a lot of money to spend on a game mm -hmm. that is 
a longer game, especially when you add all this stuff into it. You're talking about a two, three hour game, particularly if you're playing with more people. I feel like the strength is there. Yes, and it keeps hitting the table for us. So if you think this is a game that your group is going to play, I would say that the best way to get it is to get all of it, except maybe that board. Yeah, and I think a lot of it just comes that you could add in a little bit every few months, every few plays, so that you got, got it fresh and new. Like You don't have to go buy it all at the same time, but I feel like all of it is valuable to have. I would say start, obviously, with the base and maybe get Prelude first. Or maybe get colonies, get colonies first. first. Yeah, get colonies first if you want to add something in, and then Prelude, and then Venus, and then Hellas and Elysium, unless you're just super needing the variety of the milestones and awards. I was, I mean, I again, I continue to like that. And I'm honestly wondering if they're going to do another map board for Expansion 6 or something. I think we're kind of running out of different sides of Mars, though. There the inside only, of Mars. There should only be the two sides, but they managed to give us three sides of Mars. Uh. Every time they announce one of these, and I'm sure you're sick of hearing it at this point, I gripe that we don't need more stuff. This game is fine the way it is. We don't need more of it because I am grumpy and don't like buying expansions. (laughs) But, like, honestly, every time we come through it, I'm like, oh, I enjoy what this added in this way. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the board is the only thing that's sort of, I, I could do without having that additional board. That'd be fine. Yeah. Because I feel like the new cards that have added have added enough variety that those milestones and awards could stay the same. But... The fact that it turns my opinion around every time, I think it speaks to the power of the design in this game. It's a really well-designed game. Yeah, good job, Terraforming Mars. A++. Now let's talk about some beers. All right, Danielle, you want to start us off with the first one here? We have two, one for each expansion. Well, yeah, obviously. Ooh. I couldn't just be like, Mars. Mars, the beer. We've done that <laughs> we did before. Do Mars, yes. Uh, first from Honeypot Meadery in Anaheim, California, we have Prelude, which is a mead. No. It is 12% ABV. And it is an orange blossom mead. This was their first production offering and stars strong citrus character, obviously because it's orange blossom. <laughs> it is also used as their base for a number of their fruited and spice meads, orange in the rye, for example, or OBB bourbon barrel. They they use this as their sort of base production beer, and it is uh, available in I think it's it like three fifty. It's bottles. Yeah, it's yeah. it's available in bottles. Yeah. So if you are in California, check out. From Honeypot Meadery, Prelude. And then for Colonies, we have from Cabinet Brewery, that is K-A-B-I-N-E-T Brewery. They are in Belgrade, Serbia, and this is To the Moon and Back. It is an Imperial IPA, 7.6% ABV and 70 IBU. Here's a direct quote from their website that I would like to share with you. So many, quote. so many harmonious tastes that an emotional reaction is possible due to its consumption. Thus, it is good to be on standby, ready for an embrace or a kiss. Also, it has Columbus, Citrus, Centennial, Simcoe, Cascade, and Pacific Jade Hops. You can order it from their web store, but, like, not in the U.S., of course. Oh. Sounds like a good combination of hops. And this brewery has received awards for Best Beer in Serbia a number of times, so I wanted to highlight it because it's really awesome to see great beer coming out of all over the world. Mm -hmm. And we don't do enough of these beers that are from countries that you might not normally think of when you are thinking about craft beer. That's cool stuff. And we should think about that. Yeah. And if you would like information on these or any of the beers we've talked about or any of the games we've talked about, by all means, visit our show notes section at our website, draftmechanic.net, and Danielle will have all of those links nice and clickable for you. Mm -hmm. Unless the brewery website is really bad, which is a 50% chance. Either it is or it isn't. These are pretty good, I think. (laughs) All right. Time to take a quick break, and we're going to come back and do our own little beer segment about expanding beer, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Not like, you know, growing beer, but like changing beer and adding new things. Yeah, you know, variants. Want a second opinion on some of the games we talked about on this episode? Check out some other great content creators at punchboardmedia.com. So I wanted to talk about variants really quick because it goes very well with the Expandopalooza theme that we've got going on. We've actually talked about variants once before, back in episode 12, but if you didn't know it was there, you wouldn't know it was there. Because when I did the show notes at that point, I wasn't very good at it. I didn't mention anything about a beer segment in those show notes. The only reason I knew it was there is because I was like, I think I talked about Sculpin at some point. Because I remember there was like 15 different variants of Sculpin for a while. And there's a random link for Sculpin at the end of those show notes. I'm like, oh, this is probably it. Went back. Yeah, that's it. But I wanted to talk about it in a little bit more of a reasonable way at this point, (laughs) because variants are really, really popular, but they also have their detractors as well in the craft beer community. A variant, in case you don't know what a variant is, is when a brewery will take a beer that they already brew and they will change it in some way, whether that's through barrel aging or through the adding of an adjunct or both or 
the adding of many adjuncts, Mm -hmm. and they'll create a new beer that is often marketed as the base beer with whatever that change is added to the end of it. So a beer that we talk about a ton around here, Skillet from Barrio Beer Co., because we haven't Mm -hmm. mentioned them yet, they do variants every year. They do a Skillet six ways where they have different fit variations on that same base beer that they present, and it is a special event that is done at the brewery. This is one of the main reasons that these variants are made if they're not packaged. They'll be a special event at the brewery, or they'll be at a festival where you can try something that you may be familiar with presented in a different way. Obviously, barrel-aged variants are often packaged, and they are often a lot more available. People love a bourbon barrel-aged beer, so if you already have a beer that ages very well, a brewery may produce a bourbon barrel-aged version so that they can have a different flavor to somebody who's already familiar with the base beer. One of the benefits of this is if you've already brewed a beer that has the quality that you were looking forward to brewing, making a variant of that beer is likely still going to have that initial base quality. Now, you may put an adjunct in it or barrel age it in a way that's going to make it more or less good, but at least you know what you're starting with is not untested. Anybody who's done a science experiment kind of knows that you should know what you're (laughs) starting with before you start doing weird stuff to it. So you're going to get a ton of variants, and it's one of the things that I often come up against when I'm pulling stuff for on taps. A lot of breweries will produce variants only once, or they won't package it in any way, and it's not really available. And then once those few six doles or whatever they've brewed, that one cask that they've made is gone, you're never going to be able to get it again. And if you do get it again, it may be with slightly different adjuncts, and it'll be marketed as a different variant. And I try not to put those in on taps because it's not useful to you guys if they're never going to happen again. Now, sometimes those variants will be very successful, and then we get stuff like Season Skillet, which mm-hmm. is actually canned and sold repeatedly, or those bourbon barrel aged bottles that I was talking about. You know, a lot of times if a variant is popular and it's reasonable to produce it in a larger context, breweries will produce it. Like I said, there are 15 variants of Sculpin or something like that. Mm-hmm. Now, there is a little bit of pushback from the craft beer community, because a lot of people are saying that this is chasing what we in board games are generally calling cult of the new. You know, people who want to have a new beer every time they have a beer, and they consider breweries to be just taking advantage of this by creating a similar beer to something they've already brewed and just making it a little different. I think that that might be a slightly closed-minded way to look at these variant beers, but I do kind of understand it from the perspective of production, because a brewery can only make so much beer. And if they're spending a lot of their resources, be it hops and yeast and malt, or be it floor space for storing stuff, or even just employee time, on making variants of a beer that they've already brewed, so they're releasing the example that I saw complained about a lot was Bomb, which is a beer that Prairie makes, and they make quite a few variants of it. They made a Christmas. six, well, they made a, a not a six pack, a four pack of all the different parts of the Bomb variant that they made, broken out into individual oh, yeah. variants, and it's taking away production from other beers that they might be making that they now either can't make or need to make a more specialty commodity because they're spending all of this resource making the variants of a beer that frankly was probably very popular before they started making these variants. Mm. I understand if you really like the other beers from a brewery that you might feel that way, but at the same time, it's also a little bit of old man yells at cloud. (laughs) One thing that's really interesting is that it adds value to going to events. And I, I had mentioned that earlier that, you know, a lot of times these are only available one off, but It adds value not only to events at the specific brewery, but if they're bringing them to like a festival type event, it adds value there too. One of the things that is local to us is Raleigh Rare Beer. I know a lot of times at GABF, there's a lot of one-off variant type of stuff that's being served. And it's just adding a little bit of excitement to going to an event. I like to think of drinking a variant as sort of similar to the way I would before I purchase a board game expansion. If you have an idea of what the base is going in, like I would assume you would if you're buying an expansion for a board game, you know, you've played that base game. The variant is going to work off of that and the best ones will highlight the best things in that initial beer. There are ones that will take things that you might not have even noticed in the initial beer and amplify them or in in a game, take 
parts of a game that you might not have focused on and amplify them. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. The best ones will make a nice blend that can essentially live in the box, be like their own version of a beer that will be out and you'll get, you know, maybe a a bourbon barrel aged variant that is on the shelf right next to the regular beer that you're getting. And I think that's the way to look at it. Don't be like, oh, you're making a whole ton of different things and it's just it's just a money grab. Sometimes I'm not going to say it's never a money grab, but sometimes what it's going to do is it's going to take that base idea and it's going to amplify it a lot. And at the very least, it's going to change up what you're experiencing in this one minute. I would love for you guys, if you have favorite variants, to let me know what they are, either in the Board Game Guild thread or on, I mean, I guess our Twitter or Facebook or anything like that. If you're on our Slack channel, let me know, because I absolutely love to hear about the cool variants that people have made that just amplified the best parts of what they had to start with. Yeah. Well, I agree, and I would like to hear all of those thoughts as well. So please, anywhere, draftmechanic.net is obviously the one-stop shop for all your draft mechanic needs. At Draft Mechanic, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we got a Slack channel, draftmechanic.net slash Slack, if you want to sign up on there and talk with us about board games, beers, and also, I don't know, puns as well. (laughs) We have a Board Game Geek Guild that is guild number 2470. If you would like to check out the thread for this episode, let us know not only your favorite variant beers, but anything else that we talked about the expansions we've been talking about, what you're excited for, what we didn't talk about that you are excited for to expand your game collection, Mm -hmm. let us know. Pick up the Draft Mechanic Micro Badge, too. I'll said that. Yay. If you happen to be in the Charlotte area, our next game night is March 7th at Good Road Cider Works. We would love to see you there. That is a Thursday. Mm -hmm. Draft Mechanic is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. Visit grayfoxgames.com and sign up for their newsletter for the latest. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. All right. I'm done. You done? No. As always, I would like to remind our listeners to please game responsibly and tell them that I'll see them back here in two weeks for another round. I'm done with that. Good night. Night. Draft Mechanic episode 96 was recorded on Sunday, March 3rd, 2019 in front of a live studio cat. Hey, this is Patrick. And this is Eric. From Patrick Patrick and and Eric in the morning. Join us every now and again for about a half an hour as we freeform chat about whatever's on our minds and how it all relates back to our favorite hobby, board gaming. Patrick and Eric in the morning can be found on the What Did You Play This Week podcast feed and on the Punchboard Media site. Happy listening. Punchboard Media. Where we all bring something to the table. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com.